Before we start, though, let's, uh, let's have a uh, short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before thee acknowledging that thou art the giver of all truth. And then it is our obligation to study that truth and divide between it and that which is false. And we're grateful for this study that helps us to do that. We pray, Father, that we may ever be diligent students of thy word and evaluate it in terms of, of the things we learn in terms of what is written. So we ask their blessings upon us as we engage in this study. Indeed, as we work on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray they'll continue to bless us. We pray for this country and all who are striving to, uh, to uh, abide by that truth. We pray for uh, the church also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> uh, last week we got into a study of uh, enthymemes. And you may recall that. Um, should have it on your screen now. Into means in, in this formal study of logic, you'll see some of these words used, and it's just a shortcut uh, for for use in studying to to uh, describe a whole area of study. <clears throat> and a lot of these uh, words. Of course, come from the Greek or Latin, as the case may be, and his words that, at least the concepts we are familiar with, like this word enthymeme, I'm sure that uh, most of you have never heard of that, and you're certainly not using it in your everyday uh, conversation. But it's uh, it's a way of using logic in our everyday conversation. And whether you realize it or not, <clears throat> you are logic machines. You use logic every day. <clears throat> you just don't put it into a formal context. <clears throat> so we use logic uh, daily in our normal conversation. Now, I know I went over this last, last week, but we'll go over it again. But we usually don't put our <clears throat> normal conversation into this somewhat uh, stilted standard form syllogism. We, we don't do that. It's one reason it's just not necessary when you're in a casual conversation. <clears throat> if you uh, are clear enough in, in stating the topic you're talking about, you don't need to go into this standard form syllogism just not necessary. And of course, the going into <clears throat> this uh, formalized uh, standard forms kind of puts a, oh, a hindrance on a normal conversation. <clears throat> but nevertheless, you may not state premises in your normal conversation, but they're still there. If you're making statements about something, the premises and the conclusions are there. And uh, and this is called an enthymeme when you when you don't actually state it formally, but it's there. It's an enthymeme, which just comes from the Greek uh, to keep in mind. It's in your mind. You're just not stating it. <clears throat> So here's a uh, argument that men he hear every day, gladly. You aren't invited to a baby shower because only women are invited. That's normal conversation. <clears throat> but to put it into a uh, formal uh, stated syllogism or categorical syllogism, we have to uh, translate it into this categorical form. <clears throat> and to do that, 
get to find out what the conclusion is. So the conclusion is the uh, first statement. For whatever reason, or whatever premises are, you're not invited to the baby shower. So that's the conclusion. And do we translate this into a categorical form? Gives us no you. We're trying to do it in the AE I know form. No you. None of you. Uh, everything that is you. You could say all of you are not invited persons to be doing the same thing. But no you. Standard form are invited persons. <clears throat> So the second uh, statement is only women are invited. So to put that in the standard form, we would say all invited persons are women. So you look at the two statements, uh, <clears throat> got invited persons. So that's the major term, invited persons, the major term. So there we see all invited persons are women, and it's also the major premise. <clears throat> so putting this in the proper order and leaving the space for the uh, missing premise, which is the minor term, we have all invited persons are women. <clears throat> and the three little dots there is just shorthand. You'll find this in the math, physics, a lot of uh, scientific notation, you'll find that it's just a shorthand. <clears throat> if you want to write therefore all the time you can, or you can just put the, the three dots. Therefore, no you, that's a uh, universal statement, no you are invited persons. So the missing premise must contain the terms that have been used only once invited persons have already been used twice. So the ones that have been used only once are women and no you, or you, if you will. So if the person is arguing valid, and we're not saying it's true or sound, we're just saying, is it a valid argument? The missing premise must be an E statement. So since an E statement is equivalent to converse, it doesn't matter in what order the terms are placed. That the, the missing premise can be no you or women, or it could be no women or you, it could be either one. So the complete syllogism would then be all invited persons are women. No, you are women. Therefore, no, you are invited persons. See the two premises, all invited uh, per, are invited persons used only once in the first two premises and use only used once in the first two premises. Women's used twice once in the, in the major premise, once in the minor premise, but it is not in the conclusion. Therefore, it is the uh, middle term. The enthymeme uh, has thus been translated. Remember, enthymeme is just what's in the mind. It's been translated to categorical form with the assumed premise set in parentheses. So it's an A. Uh, EE2 -E syllogism, and you can see the lessons on the uh, figure of syllogisms. Uh, figure two is a major premise, P is a minor, minor premise, and S is M, middle premise. <clears throat> Consider another example from the Bible, Matthew 27, verse 4. Judas said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Now this is an enthymeme. He didn't put this into categorical form, but it can be. So what was he, uh, Judas, assuming in this enthymeme? 
first we put the conclusion I have sinned, whatever he says, it the conclusion is because of these things he did, he sinned. So put in a categorical form, we could say all I, Judas, all I am a sinner. The given premise contains the minor term I, so it's the minor premise. We put it into categorical form and we had saying, all I am an innocent blood betrayer. Because you know he sinned by betraying innocent blood. So what's the assumed premise? Well, it's the major premise, it must contain both the middle term, innocent blood betrayer, and the ma major term sinner. So we should assume that he was making a valid argument if we can. If so, the only uh, valid syllogism that ends in a universal affirmative, that's a A-1, A, A A's are universal affirmatives, you remember? Figure one is major premise is M is P and the minor premise S is M. Thus the complete argument is all innocent blood betrayers or sinners, all I, Judas, am an innocent blood and betrayer. Therefore, all I, Judas, am a sinner. <clears throat> so let's use another example from Matthew 10, 40. He who receives you receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So if we place the uh, premises in categorical form and in the proper order, we obtain all receivers of me, makes it universal, are receivers of him who sent him, sent me. <clears throat> and all receivers of you are receivers of me. So the conclusion, well, obviously Jesus wishes us to conclude that he who receives you receives him who sent me. We translate this in the proper form and we place it in the syllogism in the proper order and there we obtain the final product. All receivers of me are receivers of him who sent me. <clears throat> and all receivers of you are receivers of me. Therefore, all receivers of you are receivers of him who sent me. So let's uh, do just a few exercises in the enthymemes. <clears throat> Uh, let's translate the following enthymemes into standard form syllogisms. And of course, I've done this for you, but assume that the enthymeme is valid. And we're not saying it's uh, sound, we're just saying it's valid. And let's place parentheses around the assumed statement. Tomorrow is not Tuesday. We know that tomorrow's Thursday. Tomorrow is not Tuesday. Therefore, tomorrow will not have a, we will not have a test. So uh, the thing that we have to assume is that all test days are on Tuesdays. <clears throat> and no tomorrow is a Tuesday. And therefore, no tomorrow is a test day. Uh, you, you kind of follow how that works. You, we can gather that that uh, since we're not going to have a test tomorrow on Tuesday, then test days must be on Tuesday. That's got to be our major premise. So number two, no enthymemes are complete. So some arguments are incomplete. So we can say that no enthymemes 
or complete arguments, which they're not. And then we can say that some arguments are enthymemes. We have to assume that, which they are. Therefore, some arguments are not complete arguments. <clears throat> and that follows from the uh, premises. Number three, some young people are not rebels. Since not everyone rebels as a teenager. So we can say that some teenagers are not rebels. And all teenagers, we have to assume this, all teenagers are young people. Therefore, some young people are not rebels. You can't get to the conclusion from the uh, major premise without the assumption that uh, all teenagers are young people. And before most Russians are not capitalists, because communists are not capitalists. Well, First of all, we have to say that no communists are capitalists. They're, they're competing uh, economic uh, philosophies, if you will, economic systems. So one's incompatible with the other. If you're a communist, you're not a capitalist. So no communists are capitalists. That's their major premise. It covers what we're going to be talking about. Now, some Russians are communists. We know that all Russians are not. So we know that some Russians are communists. In fact, even a majority of them, but in logic, when you say some, you may me be talking about 99%, but you're just saying some Russians are communists. We have to assume that to kind of get to the conclusion that some Russians are not capitalists. If all Russians are communists, then we could not uh, make that uh, therefore statement. But we know they're not, so some Russians are not communists. <clears throat> Number five, God does whatever he pleases, and he is pleased to save sinners. So, so usually uh, begins a conclusion. So we can put this in standard form. All things he pleases, or you can say all things God does, all things he pleases are things God does. Or you can say God does all things that please him. They are things that please him. So all saving of sinners, and of course, and just an enemy, we just say, uh, the salvation of sinners or something like that. But in standard form, we'd say all saving of sinners is a thing he pleases. It's something that God pleases to do. So therefore, all saving of sinners is a thing God does. Now you may be thinking, I thought there were some people that weren't saved, were they not? <clears throat> But if they are saved, it's because of their own actions. But God does the salvation because all of us are uh, sin falling short of his glory. Therefore, uh, let's repeat the above exercise using into means uh, from the Bible. John 9, 16, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. <clears throat> so we can put that in standard form. All men from God uh, are Sabbath keepers. No, this man is a Sabbath keeper. Uh, Therefore, no, this man is a man from God.
Let me scroll that up. I'm gonna make it a little larger. <clears throat> Number two, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And from, it comes from Psalm 23, verse four. So what we have to assume is no person with you, you're with me, so no person with you will be an evil fear. I don't fear evil because you're with me. All I am, a person with you. All that I am, I'm a person with you. Therefore, no I, Again, it's an awkward way of saying it, but it's standard form. No I will be an evil fear. And number three, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, for you created all things. Revelations 4, verse 11. And the thing we assume is all creators of all things anybody that's able to do that, are beings worthy of glory. All God is the creator of all things. So we're, we're putting that in the universal form of all of something is a universal A form. All God is the creator of all things. Therefore, all God is a being worthy, worthy of glory. <clears throat> Verse, uh, Romans 4, 16, number four. Therefore it, and of course he's talking about the promise. Uh, therefore it is a faith that it might be according to or by grace. So we can say all things that are of faith, or we could say come by faith, are things according to or by grace. And that's the uh, premise that we have to assume. So all it, again, that's the promise, is a thing that comes according to or by faith. If the conclusion is, therefore, all the promise is a thing according to or by grace. Number five. <clears throat> Again, these are words from Jesus, Matthew 12, uh, 49 through 50. Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We can say it this way, all people who do the Father's will are my family members. And we could also say all Father's will doers are my family members. But would you say all people? So all the people here are people who do the Father's will. That's what we assume to get from the one premise to the conclusion. Therefore, all the people here are my family members. So let's move on to. Uh, Hypothetical syllogisms. And this is sort of a long one. So I, uh, many arguments in standard English are given in the form of hypotheticals. And hypotheticals are, are just an if then language. At the time, the statements. Uh, could be translated into universal, uh, or at that time the statements uh, could be translated into universal uh, categorical statements, A or E. Remember the A, E, I, and O? 
and the argument then treated like other categorical syllogisms. Hypothetical syllogisms can also be examined in a manner different from categorical syllogisms. Now first let's look at what is called a pure hypothetical syllogism. Uh, this form of argument employs only hypotheticals. We could say if P then Q, if Q then R, and then we're not saying P uh, is Q or Q is R, we're just saying if they are. If they are, therefore, if P then R. And this symbol, and I don't know what that symbol is called, but uh, it can be used for if then. And you see that U laying on the side, <clears throat> on the driver's side, if you will. If then, it, you see, yeah, at the end of this particular uh, lesson here, I've uh, set forth some commonly used symbols used in uh, logic. They're used in other sciences also, but uh, particularly here in logic. <clears throat> so we can symbolize it like this. Uh, if P, then Q. If Q, then R. Therefore, if P, then R. Now this is a valid argument. May, may, may not be a true, may not be a sound argument, but it's valid. <clears throat> so it can be translated into AAA-1, -A -A all P is Q, all R is Q, therefore all P is Q. And then figure one is a major premise, M is P, and then a minor premise, S is M. And that's a <clears throat> categorical syllogism. So here's an example of a valid, pure, hypothetical syllogism. If I study, let's call that P, then I will get good grades. We'll call that Q. If I get good grades, Q, then my parents will be pleased. Let's call that R. Therefore, if I study P, then my parents will be pleased, R. Therefore, if P, then R. <clears throat> and the uh, idea here is that you will only get good grades if you study. So you can say, if I just merely go through the exercise of studying, then my parents are going to be pleased. Why is that? Because you get good grades. So hypothetical statements combine two categorical statements into one new if-then statement. So the categorical statement after the if, I study, is called the antecedent, usually abbreviated P. The statement after the then is called the consequent. So the antecedent, ante just mean before, it goes before, and the conce means after, so it comes after. So the afterwards, the consequent is predicated on doing the antecedent. So the antecedent of the above conclusion is I study. And the consequent is uh, well, I will get uh, good grades. I think I have that wrong. I will get good grades. <clears throat> no, that's right. Excuse me. It is my parents would be pleased because it uh, it's in the conclusion as a then. So pure hypothetical syllogisms can also be invalid. Consider the following argument. 
if you are a woman, then you are human. If you are a man, then you are human. Therefore, if you are a woman, then you are a man. And I know we can make jokes about this. The current work environment we're in, crazy environment we're in, but it is still an invalid syllogism. I don't care what people say, it's still invalid. The argument then that would take the following form. If P then Q, and you know, using the symbols, if P then Q, and if R then Q, then if P then R. Some syllogisms combine hypothetical and categorical statements. These are called mixed hypothetical syllogisms. <clears throat> we consider two valid and two invalid forms of mixed hypothetical syllogisms. Now again, we're going to use uh, <clears throat> terms that uh, most of you are not familiar with. Um, but once you you know examine these forms and associate it with the, the terminology, it won't be so uh, confusing. So the form called modus ponens looks like this. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. And uh, to put it in real life terms, we can substitute uh, just in everyday English. If I study P, then I will get good grades. P, I study. Therefore, I will get good grades. That's a modus ponens. So the first statement is a hypothetical statement. And the second statement is a categorical statement. So the first statement is going to start with a if, if I do something, then something will happen. And the second statement is, I do something. There's no question about it. I do it. Therefore, you know, you get Q. Here's another example of a modus ponens. If something has a complex design, P, then it has a designer, Q. Living cells have a complex design. That's just a categorical statement. Therefore, living cells have a designer. And the second type of argument is called a modus tollens. This form of this argument is, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. You'll see the difference here is in the uh, in modus tollens, ponens, we'd say if P then Q, Q, therefore P. You see how it changes? So modus ponens and tollens just seem to be reverse of uh, each other, the converse of each other. So using the same uh, real life terms, we can get if I study P, then I will get good grades. <clears throat> Same as in the Ponin's uh, argument. And then that little uh, till sign means it, it's a negative of uh, the uh, use on the side. I did not, well, it's a negation anyway, excuse me. I did not get good grades. Therefore, logically, I did not study under a modus tollens argument. If you use these symbols, it would be like this. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So here's a second example of a modus tollens. 
if a school is classical P, <clears throat> then logic is taught in that subject. That's an if in if then statement. <clears throat> logic is not taught in the public school. That's a negation of Q is not Q. And it's categorical, categorical statement. Therefore, the public school is not classical. Therefore, till sign P, therefore not classical. There are also two fallacies that uh, take a similar form to the arguments presented above. <clears throat> yeah, by the way, you can have a classical uh, school that doesn't teach logic. The first is the fall fallacy of affirming the consequence. So named because the second premise affirms the consequence of a hypothetical statement. And it appears as follows. If P then Q, and we're gonna affirm the, the consequence, you know, if you look up above here, we affirmed the P and not the Q. And here we're affirming the Q and not the P. So we put that in plain English. If I study P, then I will get good grades. And so we're going to affirm the consequence. If I study as the antecedent, and the uh, I will get good grades as a consequence. So we're going to affirm the consequence. I got good grades, Q. Therefore, I studied, <clears throat> and that's a modus. Uh, that's affirming the consequence. <clears throat> and uh, this is what is called a non sector. And we use this a lot, and we not really in logic, but when we're um, or criticizing someone's comment, we, we say, you know, that's, you know, whatever they conclude, that's a non sequitur. It just doesn't follow what they said. So then that's what it means in uh, Latin. It does not follow non sequence. The student may have gotten good grades. Some other way. If I study, I get gr good grades. I get good grades. Whether it's any other way to get grades other than studying. So the, the uh, conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from that. Therefore, I studied. So uh, you may have gotten some good grades another way. He may have cheated. It may be in an easy A course. It may be the teacher's pet. Or maybe he's just a genius. He doesn't have to study. It just comes to him as it does to a genius. Uh, the initial statement does not say studying is the only way to good, get good grades. <clears throat> there is therefore no basis for the conclusion that studying must have been the way that the good grades were obtained. So here's a uh, clear counter example. If you were or are a gorilla, and then you'd have two legs, that's P and Q. <clears throat> two legs is Q. You have two legs, therefore you must be a gorilla. <clears throat> the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Therefore, affirming the consequent is invalid. We don't want to affirm the consequent. The other fallacy is called denying the antecedent. Remember, we talked about the antecedent and the consequence above. Because the antecedent of the hypothetical statement is denied in the second premise. If P, then Q, well, P is the antecedent and Q is a consequence. 
And if we say not P, well, that takes out the whole if P, takes it all out. So if P then Q not P, therefore not Q. So let's put that in a real life example. If I study P, that's the antecedent, then I will get good grades. That's the consequence. I did not study, you're denying the antecedent. Therefore, I will not get good grades. Now that's a non sequitur, it doesn't follow. You may not study, but you may still get good grades. So let's use the, uh, uh, you know, common language using a counter example. If you were a gorilla P, then you would have two legs. That uh, equates to the P and Q above. You are not a gorilla. That equates to the not above, not did not study. Therefore, you do not have two legs. It's the same, exactly the same form as the one right above it. And we know this can't be true. You do have two legs. So that demonstrates the denying the antecedent is invalid. Here's a summary of the mixed uh, hypothetical syllogisms. And we're not going to go through these. You can look at these uh, under the modus ponens uh, and the modus tollens. These are the valid modus ponens and the uh, modus tollens. And the, here's the invalid. <clears throat> In the modus ponens, if you affirm the consequence, it's invalid. In the modus uh, tollens, if you deny the antecedent, that's invalid. So, and here are the commonly used symbols, uh, just in case you want to just memorize those. It's not difficult to memorize. So that concludes uh, the hypothetical syllogisms. And we'll next week we'll get into hap the hypothetical syllogisms exercise. And we will not go over hypothetical syllogisms again. But that uh, puts us past time. So we will begin with the uh, this particular uh, lesson next week if you want to be looking at it. Appreciate your attendance.